Hi. Hi. How many people have ever seen me speak before? How many people have not ever seen me speak before? OK, mixed bag. Those who have, who've seen me speak at KakalakiCon? I've been there many times. If you've not been to the CarolinaCon or KakalakiCon event, we recommend it strongly. Uh, the best, I had like the best time a few months ago when we were there. And that was the crazy, you know, fire safety talk and fire suppression talk. A lot of hands clapping. I loved the whole, you know, audience interaction. That was beautiful. We are a little tighter on time today. So while I will always take questions, pretty much always, like I love questions and interaction and feedback, I will say I have giveaway stuff that I'll be talking about. The giveaways are for particularly good questions after this event. Right? So if you really want free things, hold your great question until we're all at the bar or something. If you have like a burning desire to explain something that you like, wait, I didn't understand. I, I will take like a hastily shouted question if you can't keep it down. That's OK, too, because chances are someone else is also confused, maybe even me. And I'll be like, oh, why did I say it that way? But this is something that I want to try to get through. We, uh, we know that we're going to use the full hour, maybe a couple men, but we're going we're gonna to keep it all in here. This was a talk that was supposed to be presented years ago. And then, you know, we all stayed home for a couple years. In fact, my co-presenters and I, so Max and Bobak, they were very instrumental in lots of the work that I do in the security world. They're great people. And like Bobak works with me at Core and Red Team Alliance and Maxis with me at Tool. So we were all like, hey, man, when are we ever going to do this? And we're going to try to restart it. And it was going to be B-Sides Orlando this year. We're like, hey, it was going to originally be B-Sides Orlando and like, we, what did you say, November of 2020? Turns out we couldn't make it to that one. So we're like, all right, th next year, next year, this will be the year. And then about a month or two ago, Maxi was like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I'm, I can't make those dates. And then uh, like a week after that, Bobak was looking and he's like, oh, man, you said what? No, dude, I'm so sorry. I can't make those dates. And then I looked at my calendar and I was like, Tabitha, hey, I'm so sorry. I can't make those dates. So we're not there, but we are here. I encourage you to bounce down to B-Sides Orlando, and it's a very nice event. Other people who are also, again, super instrumental in this field, you'll see me mention Emil a number of times in this talk. He is the head of Dangerous Things. I'll mention Dangerous Things very frequently in this talk. This is not a vendor pitch of any kind. I don't work for Dangerous Things. I don't work with Iceman. Uh, I've worked with Iceman, but I don't work for him. Uh, the Prox Grind and Proxmark community, these are all great people. Their names come up constantly because they are like the paragons of these fields. But uh, you'll see various things that I'm mentioning, like I'm not trying to sell you anything up here. In fact, a lot of this talk is telling you stuff you don't need to buy. And I'm trying to untangle a world that might be fascinating to you, but confusing. The folk that you're seeing there also have loads of resources online. So Dangerous Things has a huge user forum where you can ask all kinds of questions about bio implants. Yes, we are talking about putting tech in your body in this talk. I know it's labeled a keynote. I've been asked to do a keynote many times in my life, and I don't, I'm not a thought leader. So I'm just like, I'm going to give you more information and actionable knowledge. So maybe that's keynote -y. Who knows? Discord. Uh, Iceman. Iceman has old Discord. If you're interested in RFID hacking, Absolutely a great place to be, a great place to learn, a very cool community to answer questions about RFID. Who here has ever used like a Boopy RFID card? Who has ever used something in an unauthorized way that you've cloned or copied? All right, there's some hands. We'll talk about RFID and electronic credentials as a little primer, just to get everyone a bit up to speed. But most of what we're going to talk about is going to be squarely in the sort of amyl, you know, metal going under the skin in a needle technology zone. Who here has got any piercings in their body or tattoos on their body? All right. So yes, body modding, biohacking. Who here has an IUD or has ever chosen to be child free by like medical intervention? You are a biohacker. Biohacking is something humans have been doing for a very long time. Just because you can program an implant now doesn't mean it's new. Electronic credentials have been around for a very long time. RFID badges, there are loads of HackerCon talks that can get into this in more detail. There are trainings. There are all kinds of things to learn. If you've never taken any of them, understand most credentials are just like a little folder. They have a string of data that is very short, and that's it. The folder means like you can't read it as a human, but the actual information is very straightforward. It is like a user number, a card number, a, a, an ID number. And you're like, boop, I am this number. That is how loads of access control works. It is not complicated. 
And we have a little analogy here to understand exactly who is making the decisions in an access control environment when you want to get in. Understand this, the card reader, the first person you speak to with your credential, here's your credential and your card reader. The card reader doesn't know who you are or care who you are. The card reader's only job is to relay information about that little string up to the door controller. That is the boss who makes all the decisions. And the boss doesn't open the door. She's got better things to do. The boss will talk to the door hardware. That'll be some sort of electric strike or electric lock or electrified handle set. But it's kind of a little relay race of your credential. And the fact that all these pieces are so disconnected that, again, we're not going to dig way into access control. But when you start realizing, you're like, how is it this simple? Cloning is really that easy? Yes, because these systems have to bolt together a lot of different components across a wide array of vendors. And it is really simple under the hood once you start to see this. So when an access control system is online, a badge reader is online, you see it on the edge of a building, a little LED is probably on, that reader is always looking to talk. It is always offering power out into the world. There's a little radiant field of energy around that reader. You can detect it with a little field detector. And that's the reason for this is the credentials don't have a battery in them. They don't have power. These are coupling with the reader. They are getting pet power from the reader to wake up the credential. So when you show up with your badge, you say, oh yeah, I am near a reader. Hi, I'm this number. Most of your access control system, little boopy cards, can only do that. They, they wake up and they, whoever's talking to them, they're like, I'm this number. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm this number. Hi, I'm this number. Nice to meet you. They'll just spit that out. The reader gets that. And again, the reader doesn't know if you're authorized or not. The reader's only job is to call the boss. The boss will say, oh, this number's here. Well, let's see. Uh, look up my lookup table. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're authorized. Let's let them in. Hey, doorman, open up. And they'll send a low voltage signal out to the door hardware, which, if you're authorized, lets you in. If it's that simple, and the cards are always looking to talk to anyone who wants to talk to them, you can understand that cloning is pretty simple. We saw hands earlier when I said who's ever cloned a credential. Because again, if the reader is looking to talk and the credential wants to talk, you can just pretend to be a reader. You can pretend to be a credential. It's a very simple blip of data. Here's a regular transaction that we just saw. Many of you who've done, I know a few of you do physical on-site pen tests. I'm looking at Patrick and some others. So many of you know that if you as an attacker get near that situation, not right up against the reader, you can be standing outside someone's building, you can be standing near the bus stop or in the coffee shop line. If you act like a reader, credentials get near you, and you offer a little bit of power, the credential will wake up and say, hi, I'm this number. And the credential doesn't like know that you're not the door or the door system, the credential doesn't care. It's like, I made a new friend. I told them who I am, yay. The credential's happy. And you don't do anything with that at the moment. You let this person go to the office, you watch them boop in, and you're like, well, that person was authorized. I just watched them go in. Let me see if the number I just learned will work. So you can go over to the reader, and then you can just play back that number. When the reader says, who are you? You're like, well, I just learned this number. And the system says, oh yeah, we, hey, that person just went out to their car and came back in again. Look at that. We're going to let them back in. You're authorized. So cloning attacks have been around a long time. There are a lot of tools that do it. We'll mention the Proxmark in these slides. Has anyone ever used a Proxmark? How about a Flipper Zero? Have you heard of a Flipper Zero? Yes, many of you probably clone with flippers. There are loads of cheap tools that do this now. There are, if, if there's like a kiosk at a local hardware store offering to copy your fob at the same place you can copy a key, you understand that like this is pretty turnkey at this point. You read the credential, you get the number, you shove it in a new credential. And over the years, manufacturers have tried to make this data like harder to copy because they'll say, well, yes, like if you copy it, okay, that's fine, you can copy it, but you need to know what the information means. No, you don't. You don't have to care like how it's encoded or if you can even read it. You don't need to know the implementation in the access control system if you just copy the whole number. And lo loads and loads of cloning operation works this way, where the actual implementation isn't fully broken or understood, but no one cares. We're like, OK, they do weird data bit format thing. I don't, I don't need to know all that. I just want the whole string. There's the whole string. Boom, I'm done. So credential cloning doesn't involve a lot of deep knowledge. You just have to be able to read it and replay it, or in some cases, rewrite it into other credentials, like ones in your body. 
Again, you've seen some of this tech in the field. You've seen cards, you've seen fobs. There's all different form factors of RFID credentials. There's all different readers in the field. Here's the reader I use more than any other reader. It is a Proxmark. We mentioned this tool. There are loads of tools that do this, though. We have a whole variety of gear that we bring out in our classes. Again, I'm not up here pitching you our classes or anything. And you don't need all of this deep knowledge. Here is us in class. Like, Bobek is showing people how to actually break out what is in that data payload and what the binary string means and which bits are start sentinel. And then you have these parity bits if you want to calculate it by hand. You don't have to do any of that for everything we're about to talk about here. Now, quick, quick thing that you should understand. RFID means radio frequency ID, right? It's not broadcast radio. Like you're not able to sniff or clone or do funky things across a parking lot with like a Yagi antenna. You're like, I'm going to listen in on that transaction. That's not how RFID works. RFID is ultra low power operations. Again, the credential doesn't have its own battery pack or anything like that almost all the time. We're not getting into active RFID. Most RFID is passive. You have a credential, and it's going to interact with a reader. And the way they interact is that they both have antennas inside of them. If you've ever done wireless charging of your phone or like an electric toothbrush or something, or you just remember old school physics, you put a current through one coil of wire, and that wire is tuned to the same frequency as the other wire in the antenna, you will induce a current in the other wire. That's how the credential gets power. You bring it near the field of the reader, the credential wakes up, gets power, comes online. Now, how does it communicate? Like, is this where the radio frequency happens? Now it's going to broadcast. Right? No, there is no broadcast. That even though it's an antenna, it's not broadcast and receive. So if that's not the case, like, how does it communicate? Fun analogy that I like to tell people. Let's say you were taken hostage in some house. Sorry, scary stories, but I promise you're going to get free, and I'll tell you how. The doors are boarded up. The windows are boarded up. You can't, you know, there's no phone, no internet. There's nothing to scroll on, like, online. What would you do? I'd kill myself. But let's say you happen to have very nice captors who still give you food and water. Like, the, the faucet still works. And they don't know that you have a friend at the water company. Well, the water company has to send this house a bill, right? They're sending water through the municipal pipes, but there's a water meter. If you had the wherewithal and your friend was looking, you could, at a really slow data rate, send a message by like turning the water on and off. And your friend who's like, look at the power meter. Oh, that's Morse code. That's, oh, that's where Sam's being kidnapped. Let's go get him, right? You could do that. That's how RFID works. When the credential wakes up, it actually modulates its power draw with the reader. Technically, on the silicon, it shorts the antenna to ground in the chip. But it is modulating its power draw. That is how it's, and there's a loads of ways to do that. You can do phase shift keying, amplitude. There's all different ways to play with this. But that is how the data gets sent between credentials and readers. If you understand that, you already know way more than you need to know about the biohacker stuff that we're getting into. Let's start talking about biohackery stuff, right? Because, again, you've seen sort of PVC wallet-sized cards. Many of you have those. Many of you maybe at work or hotel key cards, right? You may have seen sort of fob-type keychain credentials. Same exact thing. They have a little coil of wire, a little silicon chip in there, just a different form factor. These over here, these are stickers that if you don't happen to have, like, a, yeah, I can put this on my phone, and then I can wave my phone on my door. They're not to scale. Let's make them to scale. Or as you're seeing at the end there, also not to scale. Let's fix those, right? What are those? Those are implants. There are absolutely people out there. You are looking at one of them on this stage. My wife has them, like loads of people. I'm seeing Patrick's hands up. Quit. Who else has? I'm seeing a lot of hands right on. That's more than I would have known. Kiwi and everyone, yeah. And I know some people like, like oh, Kimmy, you all want to get them soon. So like, this is actually really cool stuff. And I'm here to not sell you on like the mark of the beast and all that nonsense we'll talk about at the end. I'm here to explain what this is, how it works, and that it's not that hard. There is video of me online. You can watch me getting the horse needle in my hands. Like Emil, Emil did it at his workshop. My wife as well. Like you can watch video of her online. Here is a building. She has the credential. She's not carrying the badge because the badge is in her hand. This is fun in my mind. I really like this stuff. So yeah, there are different technologies, though. There are all different implementations of RFID. 
And before you kind of take a big step of shoving something in your body, I'd like to give you a little bit of a primer on which ones you may or may not want, how they work, what they don't do. Because the last thing you want, it's like someone is like, I bought a new car, I'm going to go off-roading. And you're like, that one doesn't have four-wheel drive. And like, oh, no, that's a car. You could like return it, you know? If you put something in you, like you can, you can take them out. We'll show you footage of that too. But make the right choice before you dive in quickly. Most people, they see this and they're like, oh, yeah, that's pretty easy. I can put it right in. There's all different implementations. That's what I want to cover. There's all different form factors, too. Most people are familiar, I think, with these little glass sort of grain of rice style implants. That's what all of mine currently are. Most of the people I know tend to have these small glass capsules. They come with a little syringe. They bloop, bloop, right? I mean, again, I'll show you footage later if you want to see it. They're not the only kind. The antenna is very small inside of these. It can make coupling with a reader finicky, and we'll talk about tips of how to fix that. But for that reason, some people have experimented with slightly larger implants. So this was the original generation of Flex implant. It is a better antenna. It is not a glass capsule. It's too big to be solid, but it is a flexible biopolymer. Now, you're not getting this in you with a needle, though. This is a much more involved process. You're talking scalpels, possibly dermal elevators. It's, it's a thing, right? So the sweet spot, which is just kind of becoming the new horizon, if you're up for it, what I call the mini flex, or it's really just the, the latest generation of flex implant. These are not glass case. They are flexible. They are really nice. They are of a size that looks intimidating, but you can get them in with a needle. So it's no surgery suite. You can do this at a piercing shop if you don't mind like a four gauge needle. Like those of you who do insulin or HRT or anything else like that, you're, you're doing like 25, 30 gauge needles or something. This is a four gauge. It's bigger. But you're in and out, like tum tum. You can do it. I, I will again, I'll show you footage. Sometimes also in this realm, you'll see people interested, like, oh, I'm gonna get one of those magnets. Like, yeah, there are also completely not related to RFID. There are implantable magnets that come in various bio encasements. And you can do fun stuff if you know how magnets work, but whatever, it's kind of a party <laughs> trick. Same idea, it's in a, but you'll see these on websites, and you're like, well, what is this like another product I should get? Make that decision on your own. I'll tell you some things about magnets that are perhaps complications that you should be aware of. Another one that you should be aware of, I've seen these, they're called firefly tattoos. They're just glowing inserts that you can put in your body. Um, does anyone, who here shoots firearms? Anybody got some trigicons, some night sights on your guns? So this is just tritium. This is just, you know, reactive tritium in a vial that will glow forever until its half-life runs out. Um, I personally, I, it's not dangerous to your body really, but like I wouldn't put it in my body. I have heard, I've seen people that like theirs didn't work right. I think Cyberize Me or Biohack Me sells these and their products aren't as great. I've known one person that it just stopped working. They're like, I hope that's not broken in me. So like, that's what that is. If you want your body to light up and glow, you can put LEDs in your body. Like again, they're not radioactive. They will harvest power from a reader. And instead of waking up a chip, they'll just wake up an LED, right? You can do that if you want to, sure. Why? I don't know, just see, why not? Why do anything? Do anything because it feels good and it's fun. That's the only reason you ever need. I don't have any LEDs in me. You wouldn't put it in? I wouldn't put it in my hand. Ah, well, where'd you put it somewhere else? That sounds a little bit uh, not safe for work. All right. So yes, there's a lot of questions and concerns that hacker-minded people start to ask. Right about when I, I've talked about this at parties and things and like, okay, well, like they instantly say, well, what's this? What's that? The biggest one tends to be what I tried to warn you about at the beginning. There's all different products out there. Online, you look at a whole spectrum of options. You're like, wow, what are all these things? What can they do? What can't they do? We've talked about the form factor, glass versus flex, but let's actually talk about the tech inside the silicon and what feature set they have. Starting with two of the most confused terms ever. NFC. NFC, especially now that it's all in our phones, everyone's like, oh, I've heard of NFC, right? That's awesome. That's like, NFC is like RFID, right? That's the same thing? Eh, not exactly. Okay, Venn diagram time. Hackers love Venn diagrams. Everything we're talking about is RFID. Absolutely. Everything that is inductively coupled using modulated power to signal, that is all RFID, ultra low power tech. NFC is a very small subset inside of this. I should really be clear here. You'll hear things like, this uses low power, high power, low. 
Low and high power, that means nothing compared to low or high frequency. Frequency is the actual, like the antenna tuning, the coil of the antenna. Almost everything you will deal with in RFID land is either low frequency, running down around 125 kilohertz for most things. You'll see 134 in some automotive applications. High frequency up in the megahertz range, 13.56. This is where your contact with smart cards are. There is UHF, there are ultra high frequency tags. They are RFID. You're not gonna see them in the implant world pretty much ever. These are used for vehicle tags and asset tracking. These are the ones that you can actually read across meters. Everything else, you're talking pretty much inches to be, to be interacting with these. Well, so what is NFC? NFC is not on here, right? NFC is a subset within the high frequency 13.56 megahertz world, right? So you're talking ISO 14443A and, and other things like that. NFC, so I've heard someone once say, like literally at a biohacker event, they were so happy, they went to the biohack village, they got two implants, and I was like, that's awesome, what did you get? That sounds, it's like, oh, it's so cool. I have an NFC in one hand and an RFID in the other. I'm like, that actually doesn't tell me anything about the implementation of what you get. That's like saying, we have two cars at home. One of them is a sedan and the other is an automobile. <laughs> okay, cool. What, what did you get though? What do they do? do they, where do you go with them? This is what we want to untangle for the next few slides. Again, we're not going to talk about UHF. We're going to ignore that at the moment. No one's doing that, at least as far as I know, under the skin. But low freak and high freak, let's, let's pop those circles out with a lot of words on them. You may recognize some of these words, especially if you have a badge system that you have a credential that you use all the time. It might have some of these names. It might have even more names. Here's a whole bunch of terms. These are all implementations of badge and credential technologies that live either in the low frequency or high frequency world. This is what we mean by credential type. When I say, what credential type are you using in your access control system? What credential type do you have implanted in your hand? I'm not as interested in the low or high frequency. I'm really caring about what function and feature set is on the chip. That, is, that actually really informs what it can do. So you say, wow, that was a huge ass list, but I want to do like all the things. I want to be as most cyber hacker possible person. Implant, I'm going to get, I guess, 27 implants, put them in all my toes and fingers. You don't have to do that because now we're going to simplify the low frequency and high frequency world a great deal. Low frequency boils down to basically one thing. T5577, you may have heard this term in RFID land. You're just here T55 or something. This is a family of chips that can do basically everything you've ever heard of in low frequency land. And you don't need to get a whole bunch of them in your hands or whatever. You can get one and be like, I can reprogram. I'll talk, let's talk about, let's talk about the T55 family of chips, all right? This is a credential type that can be reprogrammed to emulate almost any low frequency credential you have ever heard of, including ones you've never heard of that no one uses anymore because they're stupid old. But most access control out there in the world is low frequency RFID still to this day. I mean, there are way better solutions out there that are stronger, but like no one's using freaking Presco anymore or Visa 2000. But most access control that's out there in the world is old. The RFID is 30, 40 years old at this point in some implementations. Like it came out in the 80s and 90s, basically. And most of those early, like who, who's got a badge that says HID procs on it ever? That's one of the oldest implementations of RFID, and it's still got the biggest market share. It is low frequency, bloop, little blip of number string, that's it. You can absolutely pretend to be that tag. You can pretend to be Indala or AWID. All these technologies I just showed you, because the T55 family of chips, there's an instruction set that you can interact with the credential and reprogram the chips. Again, kind of an eye chart here. But this is the configuration block Little history lesson long ago when Atmel was still called Atmel, they're now called Microchip Corporation. When they first came out with this, the original Q5 or Temec chip, they knew that like, hey, people, some implementations are phase shift keying, some are Manchester encoding. What if we made a chip that you could just configure the bits and do whatever you need to do? They created this. And then we got the T5566, T5577, now even EM, who's a subsidiary of Swatch in Switzerland, is making the EM 4X05s, but they all run this T55 command set where you can change the encoding, you can change how the data is communicated, you can configure this to emulate loads of access control credentials. 
So a lot of people then like, wow, that's amazing. Microchip made this for hackers? That's cool. No, it's useful to us, but it's because a lot of these systems are stupid old, right? Like Indala. Some people might still have an Indala badge at their workplace right now. It's still in the field. This is the original Indala when Motorola made it. Motorola ain't making anything anymore in this space, right? Motorola is gone. <laughs> Motorola sold all this to HID, and HID isn't like dusting off old machines to make Indala silicon. If Indala like systems still need support and they're, they've got a customer who's like, hey, I still want another thousand Indala cards for my, HID is gonna sell them to you. They're gonna use T55 chips. That's why this chip exists. It's to support these legacy credentials that are still all over the freaking world. So let's say you're gonna get an implant. You're like, all right, I'm gonna get an implant. I'm gonna get that T55 action. What can I do with like a low frequency implant chip? What you gonna do with it? Most people just open doors. Right? So if you have an access control system and it is running any kind of low frequency, any of those brands I mentioned, you can clone that. You can clone it, you can program it into your T55, you can open up your office, you can open up your gym, copy your apartment fob, you can just do that. There is no protection in any of those old low frequency chips. Something like this is, again, this is Tara again at a different office. This was at a WeWork that she had a membership to. So we cloned her WeWork badge. She could open the doors there, right? If you do this at work, it's good depending on your relationship with your facilities team to like talk to them about it. I remember at one of her jobs, Tara, like she talked to facilities and they really didn't want her to do this. She was showing them she could and they got really freaked out. And they said, you can, that you were not allowed to copy our cards. What if you lose your card, but we, we, we need one card ever that can we keep a track of it because that's how we know how our security is. And we're like, she's like, you know how many people have copied their cards here? You're still using Prox. Ultimately, the solution that they hit on, they said, we won't let you do this officially, but we'll issue you a second credential and we'll watch you clone it and then we'll destroy it. So like that credential only lives in this one instance and then you have your real work badge and they could see when she was booping around the office with her real badge or her hand. And that like satisfied them, even though the logic is silly to me. Uh, most of the time in my hand, I just keep some nothing HID prox credential in my hand because it's fun to test other systems so those of you who don't know me, I do pen testing physically, I break into buildings, and if I see a badge system, and I look, I, I can identify readers from like, a, I'm like, oh, they're using Indala, that's AWID, that's, you know, whatever. But some readers are multi-tech. Some readers are called migration readers or multi-technology readers. And I'm like, hmm, they could be using iClass, they could even be using CIOS on these readers. I don't know, what are they doing? Let's see, is this gonna be a hard job? And I'll just kind of walk by, and be like, well, they might be using iClass, they might be using CIOS, but they haven't disabled Prox. So I know that gives me a possible attack vector into this building if I'm trying to clone cards or attack their cards. Other people will take, there's, there are little trigger circuits like this. This is actually one that I'm going to give away. Remember, how do you get the giveaways? By asking good questions where? Afterwards at the bar. Right, but this is just a little access controller like relay. It will read credentials and if you are authorized in its little system, it'll flip a switch. Like here's somebody starting a computer. Somebody else I know, this is uh, Eerie Quiet. He took a gun safe, he had many gun safes in his house. And as an experiment, he retrofit the lock with an electronic lock. And he's like, well, I could use the electronic keypad and he tested that. He's like, all right, so I can make the electronic safe lock works. But in a little bit of fun engineering, he actually just soldered on additional wires right into the motor. So he's like spiking the motor with these extra leads, he connected that up to a trigger, one of these little relay triggers, and he put the reader on the outside of the thing. So he made his own gun safe that operates with his hand. So he's reaching his hand here, okay, boop. Now is this high security? No, it is not high security at all, which most gun safes aren't super high secure. I have a whole talk about gun safes. I'm a GSA safe technician, I'm a vault technician, I do a bunch of stuff on military bases. This is not how we would store like military arms, but for some dude in his house, like being able to boop his hand, it was a fun project. I love that for him, awesome job, 49 bucks, way to go. Now you might say, okay, so I put this chip in me, but if I wanna clone a badge, like my gym or something, like how do I do that? Proxmark will do it. Proxmark, absolutely one of my favorite tools. This is us literally using the Proxmark on Tara's hand. There, there are plenty of tools. Like a Proxmark, it's like $300 or something last time I checked. There are cheaper tools. If you don't want to buy that, my friend Naomi did a whole video on her channel about all kind of cheaper overseas tools. She talks about the Proxmark. 
but like there are a lot of other tools out there that are much cheaper. They're a little jankier, like this is the NFC tool and it has kind of a really janky app that goes with it. But you can clone and copy and read things. Again, RFID tech has been around a while. This is the NFC tool here doing more reads. Some people may have seen, especially this one, the blue cloner gun. This is a lot of time, like this is almost looks like what you'd read pet tags with, right? The blue and the white cloner guns. You're not talking three figures for these tools. These are cheap tools, but they will read, read. You can see it's like read, write. It's a clone. It's all it does is read, replay, read, rewrite. That's what you can do with this. First caution note of many of which will exist in this talk. Let's look at the configuration block for the T55 commands again. There's a very specific thing that these chips support. I've highlighted it. What is it? Password, Password lock. Yeah, we've got our, our B-sides icon of your cassette tapes. Remember those kids if you weren't around. This is like popping the tabs on a cassette tape. You can put data on it, and then you are locking that data on it. Now, like when HID or somebody else is pushing cards out to new customers, they'll do this. They'll lock the chip. But if you're using like the blue cloner gun or something, a lot of these third-party products, they will password protect your chip. And then you can only use the blue cloner gun. Now, you don't have to do that. We know, first of all, we know the passwords on most of these products at this point. And even if you didn't, the Proxmark can recover. You can brute force a password. You can throw a card into test mode. There's a lot of ways you can still overwrite the data. But you could, someone asked me, like, I think it was Asher last week, last week. He's like, could you like jam someone's chip? I'm like, oh yeah. With a Proxmark, you can like literally put junk data in their chip and password protect it. And then their hands like bricked. Not permanently, you can fix it. But just be aware if you're getting, like the Keezy was a fun little key fob thing. The Keezy was right protecting people's T55s. And we figured out the key for the Keezy. It's actually in the Proxmark code, I think now. Another thing, these T55 chips, they're ultra low power, they're ultra low capability. They don't have what is called tearing protection. Anybody who does data integrity work might know what this is. This is if you are writing data and there's a power outage. Like you ever do a flash of a firmware and it's like, don't unplug device, flashing firmware. That's because if that gets interrupted, some devices can get bricked or get soft bricked. That can happen. It doesn't have enough memory to like take a whole data block and then wait and verify it and then write it down to the, to the memory. The T55 chips, if you lose power, which is defined as you moved a little bit and that coupling, which was never great, <laughs> failed out, you can again, you can wreck the configuration block, you can cause problems. I've never known one to be fully unrecoverable, but for this reason, people don't want this. You'll see people do funny things with antennas, getting that antenna pulled out to get as close as you can to the chip. Because again, the coupling is challenging with the teeny, teeny glass inserts. If you're doing this, by the way, you want to have your glass insert almost perpendicular to most of these coils, because you can think the coil is going, you know, the big coil is going this way. Well, which way are the coils in the chip? They're also going this way. You want them kind of lined up like that. Or you go yourself to some nice hacker developers who make specific low frequency antennas for the Proxmark just for biohackers. Tom Harkness made one. It's a little ferrite core. If you don't know RF things, like all the radio heads in this room, like, oh yeah, ferrite, that's gonna help shape the field. So again, on this case, you'd want those coils lined up so parallel along with your little glass vial. This is me with my Proxmark, and it's, it's great. Like, if you have one of these, which, by the way, I have some of these. I have them with me. Where do you get them if you want to? At the bar. Ask me good questions at the bar. Um, not only can I write and read to my hand super reliably, this one, or like, um, here's Warren, Warren Kamari. Like, he made a similar ferrite core antenna. You can get reads and writes of your chip before you even insert it. Like, inside the metal syringe, you can get the signal through. So way better field strength. And you can test to make sure, like, is there no problem? But I, the failure rate on these is really low. The quality control is really high for most vendors. But you can test, like, can I write my chip, read my chip, will it work? So ferrite core, very nice. I just did a video. How many of you know I've got some dumbass YouTube channel, right? So I just threw a video out about what are called tank circuits or LC circuits. These are really fun. So most of the time, again, the read range of RFID is small. So this is a little field detector. It has LEDs that are powering up, much like the ones you saw under someone's skin. So those LEDs, we could see where the, the field strength dropped off. And we can get maybe three inches, maybe about four inches, it's really, you're not getting anything. Let's bring the tank circuit in, bang. It is not a true repeater. 
This does not have an amplifier or battery in it. It reshapes the field. So the actual field around the reader is losing power on the edges, but it is pushing the field further out. So not only is this a fun way to like just play with card read range, but Hamspiced is who makes all these. His GitHub is linked. All my slides are going to have links. They're going to be up on my website. But Hamspiced made these little teeny versions of the tank circuit on Flex PCB. It's very nice. And they're for biohackers. Literally, this is my hand instantly getting a read where I couldn't a minute ago, right? So I have loads of these. I'm going to give them away where? At the bar. Come to the bar. So yes. There are a lot of ways you can improve the signal coupling, but this is the kind of stuff that a lot of biohackers just deal with. That's why the mini flex is way more reliable on a lot of more situations. So if you can take the four gauge needle, go with the four gauge, take a mini flex, because the developments that's going on there, really good stuff. Now I've been mentioning low frequency this whole time. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. All right, we are doing pretty okay. I've been talking low frequency, low frequency. That's what most of your access control is astonishingly still low frequency. Not all of it. You might have a work badge that might say I-Class on it. Or you might be in a hotel. Maybe you're in a hotel using like room key cards. And you're like, holy shit. Is cloning key cards that I'm, my hotel's not safe? No, almost every hotel you've ever been in with a boopy card, that's going to be high frequency. It's probably going to be My Fair, My Fair Classic, or My Fair Ultralight, or My Fair Hospitality. But all the, those are all high frequency. High frequencies, different megahertz, different clock speed on the signaling. You've got a little more power to play with. The card can support more functions. It's just going to have, if you've got a higher clock rate of the pulses, you can just do more signaling. So high frequency credentials, contactless smart cards in many cases, they can do more stuff. You're like, all right, well, if there's high frequency out there in the world, I want to get some of them in my body. Is there like a T55, but for like high frequency? No, not at all. There are standards, broadly speaking. So the NFC forum does have certain ISO standards that a lot of high frequency tech now all falls under. So they behave in understandable ways. The Proxmark and other tools can work with and read them and write to them. But all these are different implementations at this point. So again, you're going to see names you have seen. You've seen iClass. You've seen Desfire. Certainly seen MyFair, right? In, I don't know who's got an Infineon system these days. We're not going to dig way into this sort, of, this sort of chart up here. Again, you want to learn more. You learn more from us or other people offline in a class or read a bunch of things on the forums. But NFC, you can think of as falling into different type categories. Right? So the NFC forum, which was like NXP, Sony, uh, somebody else. I think they're in my notes. Yeah, Nokia. The NXP forum sets these standards. And whether you're talking about type 2 or type 4 or type 5, some of them are not that common anymore. Most things are still just type 2. Like most N tag, little NFC tags, they're all just basic type 2. Why do you want a certain thing? This is when you have a specific system that you have already researched, and you're like, I want to interact with that system. This is now informing you of which chips you want to get. Again, not a sales pitch. I am mostly up here telling you you don't need most of the things I am showing you. Or before you buy one, don't think it can do something it can't. The most common thing you will see anyone implant in the biohacker world that is high frequency is a basic what's called NTAG. And you're like, it's NFC, right? Like, yeah, it is the simplest kind of NFC you could ever imagine. I think most of these, you know, 60, 70 bucks. What does an NTAG do? It just stores a tiny string of data, more than a number. You can store a few, a few bits, you know, a few bytes, but it's just going to blip back a string of information. This is not going to interact with a fancy access control system or do anything. You're not going to you know, control satellites and nuclear missiles with your hand. This is a string of information that will just, we did one. We did one of these on a channel called Modern Rogue. My buddy Brian, his friend Jason, our buddy Cooper injected him with it. It was a fun video. What can it do? It literally, if you've ever seen somebody with like, hey, tap my business card on your phone and it'll just launch a little link on their phone, that's what, that's what they're using type two basic NTAG NFC. It is a string, and he programs his, play, his hand to like throw people up to Mr. Roboto on like YouTube. You can do that. Like, and it was fun. It was fun to do, but you can store a tiny string of information, a V card data. You could store like a Bitcoin wallet address. I've seen some douche bros do that. But like, it's, think of like Jason Bourne in the very first Bourne Identity where he had like a Swiss bank account number like in his body. You could do that if you wanted to. Like, NFC NTAG will do it. 
It's fun to put like notes in your hands, I guess. Like Charlotte, uh, their girlfriend like put a little I love you note in their body. Like that's romantic if you're a certain kind of hacker like me. My wife, for a long time, she had no other, again, you're not gonna open doors with this. You're not gonna clone a key card. So she put the Unicode character for dagger in her hand. So she's like, I always have a weapon with me, even if I'm behind TSA. You'll see, these are the same exact tags that you can buy on Amazon. And you wanna buy an NFC sticker? This, these are all NTAG, NTAG, NTAG. Sometimes you'll even see like NTAG 215 or NTAG 216. What, what's the difference? Memory. That's the only difference. NXP Semiconductor made these decades ago. They have the exact same spec, the same write endurance, the same read-write cycles. The only difference is cost and memory. So get the 216 if like, you just have a little bit. It's not a lot of memory, but that's what you got. And now they are often made sometimes with LEDs for fun because like they're shoving LEDs in a lot of these products. Be mindful of that. If you don't want your hand to blink in front of a reader, don't get the one with the LED. Check what you're purchasing before you jam it into yourself. There are implants for some of those other crazier implementations, right? So like type four NFC, like Desfire. Desfire, you can get a Desfire Evolution too. This is literally like what they use at Disney for the Magic Band. They're, they're out there. You can get, now it's not like you can just clone a Magic Band because again, these are credentials that are built from the ground up with security and an actual secure memory object in the, in the payload, right? So you could technically like enroll, if you had a friend at Disney, they could enroll your hand as another magic band, but you'd have to provision keys and so forth. You don't probably need these if you don't know what they are. Again, we're not even gonna talk about the, this is a really rare type five NFC implant. Uh, if you come across systems that use type five, those are edge cases. Some really obscure foreign like pistol cases and I've seen a padlock from overseas that was type five NFC. So Emil was like, yeah, if you ever find one, you can jam one of these in you. I was like, I'm not gonna do that. I would never, no, I don't care about type five. Also, you will start to see, I know I'm seeing people like with their phones, probably not because I'm boring, but if you are, that's fine, do you, homie. But if you're scrolling and like looking up products right now, you're gonna start to see the name VivoKey show up a bunch. Again, not a sales pitch. I don't work for VivoKey. I have no stake in this company. They were playing with some of the more bleeding edge stuff that was trying to get into like payments and doing things with secure crypto. They are still doing that. Payments is a really hard world to break into. Uh, the EMV Co. Mafia, like we're not gonna talk about payment cards right now. But they basically, they pivoted. So VivoKey works. This is like a FIPS 197 compatible crypto implant. So you can do, like you can, you can, you can pass a little open connect ID. You can try to implement like SAML type logins with it, which I know is outdated. You can log into your WordPress or Discord. I know people that unlock their password vault, like one password with a secondary authentication object using a VivoKey Spark. We're not digging way into what these can do. Again, the dangerous things forum is available to you, people smarter than me. But every one of these is still an NFC compliant device, which means at their simplest level, they can just pass a little URL. They can pass a text blob. You can store just bait. If you don't want to use all the advanced crypto functions, like you can do that. But that's why these, they're starting to put more into the stack. I think the, this is based on the, the NTAG 424, which is, again, like I'm, all these notes will be online if you want to get deep into this. But this is a primer. I, I didn't see a lot of hands go up when I said who has an implant. So that's jumping in a bit fast. The biggest question I do get though, when I mention you can do like one password login, can I unlock my phone with it? Can I unlock, like I wanted this for years. I wanted my phone to only unlock if it was in my hand. I thought that would be awesome. Google used to have like NFC unlock. It was part of their stack and then they broke their NFC stack for years. You're not gonna see this. You are not going to see this with iPhones or Androids or anything probably anytime soon or ever. And here's why. Your phone is already doing NFC things. What is the most common NFC thing that your phone is doing? What is it? Yeah, say it louder. Tap to pay. Tap to pay. Nobody wants to F up payments. Mobile payments is like the, every, every developer engineer who's like, what if we could do somebody in the mobile payments division is like, no, you can't because we don't want to mess up that stack. We don't want the antennas trying to do different things. And to NFC and phones is basically from paying money now or doing other kind of transit transactions. So you're not gonna see these edge case log in with your hand. I don't think you'll see it ever again. You can do it with like a rooted Android phone. There are weird implementations with Lineage OS or Graphene, but you're not seeing official support for that anytime soon. 
again, VivoKey does have a flex version. They're, now they actually are finally partnering with like Fidesmo. So we're going to see payment things in the future, but that's not what interests me. I'm interested in more just edge case hacker shit. It's why my high frequency implant is a magic MyFair. So my, we've seen MyFair mentioned earlier. I've, maybe if you've done RFID things, you've heard of MyFair. NXP, who made MyFair, it's a very old technology. It's still used all the time in hospitality environments. So like, here's my little MyFair implant. What can I do with it? I can clone my hotel keys all the time to my hand. So no matter how much I have later at the bar, like I'm gonna be able to get back to my room. There we go, I can just, can't, I can lose my key, I can lose my pants. I can still get in my room, awesome. And this is kind of a silly party trick, right? Like, who really cares? But you'll see the fact that my credential is called a magic MyFair credential. We'll talk about what that means and why it's useful for other fun hackery stuff. So some of you are understanding, you're like, okay, wait a minute. So you talked about low frequency, which is most of the access control systems out there, and high frequency does like smartphone things. I can't do both, that stinks. Well, you can. I mean, I can because I just took two jabs in the frickin' hand, but many, many of these products are now dual package. Basically, like Dangerous Things and other, other vendors, they're trying to just shove a T55 into like everything now because they're stupid cheap. They add a couple bucks to the, to the silicon. So yeah, you'll get a dual package, two antennas, a low frequency, high frequency antenna, and you get two pieces of silicon all in one package. So the next, I used to recommend everyone get the next because why not? It's got a T55. And you can do a little bit of N tag, you know, hey, where's my URL? My phone will read it, whatever. My favorite one now is the X, like there is a magic implant now that's magic my fair with a T55. That's the one that I would recommend. If you know nothing about what I'm talking about, you're like, I want to get one thing. Again, I'm not selling you on anything. I am saying magic my fair is fun indoors and hotels, and the fact that you can rewrite certain data blocks, and the T55 gets you in buildings. If you're talking about magic credentials, you will sometimes see the idea of what generation are you talking about? Not getting way into this, but what, what is a magic, does anyone know, have you ever heard of magic MyFair? Get any hands, there's like four hands, okay. MyFair is a credential type made by NXP, NXP Semiconductor in Germany, one of the earliest pioneers of all kind of RFID things. One of their products is the, the MyFair chip. It's been supplanted by Desfire and other offerings now. But MyFair is out there everywhere. Certain things, like you can read and write certain memory segments with keys. You can have a read-only key, a write key. There's a configuration like block zero that says the card, the card serial number, the card type. You can't change block zero. But certain sectors are like protected. It uses protected memory. Magic MyFairs aren't really made from MyFair. They're not from NXP. They are they were just called Chinese black magic chips for a long time. They are these vendors that are making fake MyFair chips. And that's why they get sued sometimes from like, they, hey, you can't call them MyFair. You have to call them UID changeable. They have backdoor commands that the chip will wake up and respond to. And it'll arbitrarily let you change data in certain sectors, move data around, change the keys. You can change block zero, which you're never supposed to be able to do, which changes the serial number of the chip. So things that MyFair can't really do. This is how you clone, like my, my hotel key, I clone it on a Magic MyFair. Vendors don't like this and have started, mostly in Asia, trying to detect Magic credentials. Because if you present your, like, here's my room key, and you present it to a hotel door, maybe in Taiwan, the hotel might be like, oh, here's your room key, I'll open. Or it'll be like, let me throw a couple Magic commands at you, because it takes a split second. If the card wakes up and responds, the reader is like, F you, buddy. And it'll send magic commands that'll like erase the card or brick the card or other things like that. Transit systems. You'll see this in transit systems too sometimes. So to get around that, it's a ladders and walls game. Gen 1, my fair, magic commands. You can be like, well, my magic card is Gen 2, which supports the old commands, but you can like turn off Gen 1 commands. And then, well, my magic card is Gen 4. Gen 4 is the latest gen out there. I think there's even more experimental ones. But these, again, they're all just fake my fair that have different command sets. You don't need this most of the time. My, my, all my Magic MyFair stuff is Gen 1A and Gen 2. They're fine. I've never encountered a reader that's bricked my cards ever. And it's not like dead forever. You can, you can recover it if anything happens. So that's the basics of what you might want to do. Now, there are other really bold hackers out there really pushing the envelope. 
So if you're not, who, who's seen this movie or read the short story? I need more hands. Oh my, the short story is online. Like you can find it at a number of URLs. I strongly recommend you read it. Johnny Mnemonic was a story of a digital courier who could carry data in his body because he had a cybernetic implant, right? It's a very, very fun story. It holds up. The movie still holds up, honestly. Some hacker friends of mine thought that was cool. And they created something that's been nicknamed the peg leg. It is a Pi Zero. Now, you don't put a battery in yourself, right? You don't want to put lead acid or lipo battery chemistry in your body. But they did solder on a Qi charger, a wireless charger, onto a Pi, and they put memory on it. And then they put it in people's bodies. This is my buddy Michael. Michael is amazing. He was one of the first people. And left, I think Left got one. Michael got one. Bird has one. But yeah, it is literally, a, I think this is a Pi Zero W maybe? Polymer bio-encased, right? Now, it's big. It's bigger than, a, bigger than your regular implant. But you can get it in there with a little bit of effort. This is literally, it's powered by a battery bank. Like, like it's, again, you, the battery bank is external. It could be in your pocket. But here's, again, if you're not squeamish, you know, there's a little dermal lifter action going on. And Michael, no, I think he's rocking the no anesthesia life here. What does the peg leg do? What do they make it do? It's literally a mesh network pirate fire, fire, fire servo. It's running pirate box. So you could have people, like, the idea was, like, we could go to, like, a dissident journalism conference, and all of a sudden there's a mesh network with, like, banned materials that all the journalists can get. And who had, where is this coming from? So I think that's dope as hell. Like, the idea of you could have a phone or a hard drive on you that someone could take from you or search and deprive you of, jam that shit into your skin, baby. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, that's, that's a lot, right? I realize that's a bit more... That's Bird. Her arm, her arm is just kind of, yeah. Like I saw Bird. I was like, oh, you got one of the peg legs. She's like, yeah. I realize that's a bit much for some people. So I'm not pushing you this hard, right? If you're not ready, that's the last of the squeamish photos, I promise. <laughs> if you're not ready, well, there might be one or two more. Uh, if you're not ready for something like that, you can get into this, I, this world in a small toe-in-the-water kind of way. There are wearables, right? You can get NFC rings. You can get NFC wristbands. There's somebody I know, so this was someone, Jacob, uh, in the Czech Republic, he showed me, he's like, dude, I put RFID like in my watch. I hid a coil, and I put this in, and the chip still works. I'm like, that's awesome, man, that's dope, go for it. And it just looks like a watch. Somebody took their work badge, they dissolved it in acetone. This is if you want to get the chips out of a badge ever, you dissolve the PVC. They got the silicon out, they've got the copper, they made these little 3D printed ring kind of molds. And then they wound the copper, they tested the antenna, they got the antenna tuned, they put the silicon right on it, and then they had a ring that would like walk around the building, they could operate their doors in their office. That's fun. Uh, Unicorn, her, her nails, if you saw her at DEF CON, she had a variety of amazing nails that would light up and do things. Some of them were just LED based, right? So these are those, if you're in the field of, the, of any reader at all, nails will light up, that's really cool. Here's her nails, you know, Omega Mart, is it Omega Mart? But that was not the only nail you had. You also had an end tag in one of your nails, so she could share contact information on people's phones just by popping her nail on them. There was someone named Baby Doll. Uh, they put this video up also at DEF CON this year. So their nails were uh, magic, actually. She had a magic insert in one of her nails. So she's cloning her hotel key card into her finger. I think it's probably her middle finger, which is kind of, that's, that's pretty dope if you ask me. So, all right, this looks like a magic card. I have data. Let's program this card data. It really is this easy with the flipper in most instances. Because again, My Fair Classic has been around forever. It is super broken. And nowadays, if you saw the, the hotel key hacking talk at DEF CON this year, there's already new implementations of other weaknesses in My Fair to make it go even faster. And some of the unofficial flipper firmwares are getting packaged up with the newest attack. So it's really fast to clone a hotel key card a lot of times. And if you're her, like, put them in your nails. Now, we're not going to do this live. But if you want to see an insertion, it's not gross or anything here. This is what it looks like. Here we are. The hardest part was just this guy had really tough skin. Bloop. There we go. It's not spraying blood all over the room. It's not giantly painful. I mean, you know it's happening, right? You're going to feel it. But I've done this. I've known loads of people who've done this. It is not that devastatingly painful. Then you just pinch it, and then you know, you're fine. It's just a little tiny puncture wound. 
Other people have other questions about capabilities. I'm going to try to get ahead of most of the questions because we're running out of time for questions. Mobile payments, transit cards, etc. Can you do that? Not yet, for the reasons I've talked about. And frankly, I'm fine with this slow rolling because right now it's big corporations trying to do crazy shit like this and I don't like that. I don't ever want to use my biometrics to pay for my groceries or any of this nonsense. I don't want big companies driving this, this market. I actually want my data to be my data. Biometrics are something you can't change. I want people to keep playing in the implant space and doing things themselves with data that you can always change the data on the chip. You can rewrite it, you can reprogram it. I don't want Amazon dictating this to me. I want hackers doing this themselves at their own pace. Our friend Amy, Amy had a Tesla back before we knew Elon was a crazy fascist. You know, like Amy took her Tesla key card. She dissolved it. There's your chip. There's your silicon. You can encapsulate it. There are companies that will do this for you. If you have your own card, you're like, I want it encapsulated. Not that much, like 200 bucks for the whole service. Now, this was the old generation of Flex, so Amy had to go under the blade. She's clearly no stranger to piercing and body mod shops. She's a lot of ink. But now her hand could operate her Tesla. She could unlock it. She could drive it. And again, for me, the question in all of this is who controls the chip? Who controls your data? Is it you doing it as a hacker with your hacker friends? Or is it some massive corporation, venture capitalist backed, that wants your data and to tell you how to use it? That's the thing that I don't like. But be bold yourself. If you have your own credential, again, like there are customers that'll say, hey, I have this badge. Can you work with it? And company, dangerous things will do it. Other people will do it. They'll say, yeah, dissolve that sucker in acetone. Let's see the package. This is a nice little MOB package. So NXP has this MOB10 package. It's chip on, we're not gonna get into chip on board versus MOB10, but like, yeah, they'll be like, oh yeah, that's a MOB. We can, we can totally do that. Send it to us. We'll do the encapsulation. We'll test the resonance of the antennas. We'll test it. We'll double check it. And they'll send you an implant in the, like, in the syringe with the gel and the goo and like ready to go. And all you need is a body mod shop to drop that in you. The most of these places also will have a money back, like a half money back guarantee if there's ever any kind of problem. So there, the, there are hackers that are out there not doing this to get wealthy. They're doing this because they think it's fun to experiment with. And there are hackers out there that are using these. So this is Cobalt. Cobalt lives in Finland. Cobalt reached out. He's like, hey man, check out the stuff that I'm doing. And he took all different credentials in his life and he encapsulated some, he off the racked others. He's like paying for groceries. I think he lives in an apartment building where he had a little laundry card. And he's like, yeah, I put my laundry card in my hand. Why not? And it's, it's because it's him doing it that I don't have a problem with this. If you work for a company and they're like, if you want to work here, we're going to put this in your body. Tell them to F all the way off. But if you want to do it yourself, if you want to unlock your computer yourself with your hand, like by all means, go for it. There are whole groups and communities that are working on these problems, not for profit, but just for fun. A few more questions and concerns, and I know we're close on time. We're going to get out of here. Do not worry. So does it hurt? Again, like your tolerance for pain may be different than mine. Mine's kind of high. I know a lot of my friends are in the kink community. Theirs are even higher than me. But like, I don't think it hurt that much. It's compatible with like any other piercing you may have had. If you've had a body mod or a little industrial piercing, that's what it feels like. Can you use them right away? Yes, but your hand will swell a little bit, or wherever you get it done, will swell up a little bit. When that swelling is there, it's a little harder to press right into a reader. This is my hand after like a few days. It doesn't look bad, but for the first day or two, I had a little hard time getting coupling with a reader and with my Proxmark. I had no problem with the ferrite antenna. So be like, don't, you're like, oh, I put it in my hand and now it's not working. I've ruined all my decisions. I suck. Wait a couple days. Let the swelling go down. You're going to be fine. Medical questions also, can you have these during medical procedures? Like, let's say, an MRI. Yes is the answer. I'm not going to get way into this, but these have been tested up to like field strength of seven Tesla in an MRI. If you're not a medical technician, there was somebody who was an ER nurse, right? I think, uh, yeah, like trash puppy or somebody. Like, that's huge. No one's in an, in an MRI under those conditions. My friend Kara needed an MRI. Um, very, very si tiny short story here. Like Kara used to be in the Navy, had some injuries, she had trouble with falling down, and the falling down got worse. And she went to a doctor in the VA and she said, hey, I've had these problems. They said, well, we want to do an MRI. That's what we do. And the intake, they're like, do you have any piercings, implant, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, well, I have these chips in my hand. And they were like really hesitant. They're like, I don't know about that. We, we want to, that sounds dangerous. 
Can you come back? We'll reschedule you. We need, to, we need to learn more. And she's messaging me. And I said, Emil, you've done testing on this. Does she have like a white paper? And Emil was like, oh yeah, it's on the website. Like you can download this here. And she literally got the paper, printed it out. And in the appointment, she's showing it to the docs. And they're like, wow, this is actually, this is good stuff. Holy shit, yeah. No, yeah, two tests, like three. Which is, you know, if you're fine, we're fine. We'll sign, you, you sign the waiver, let's do this. And sure enough, like she went in to the MRI that day. And she's coming out. They were satisfied that it would be safe. So, okay, after the MRI, they're like, okay, so do you have anyone, do you have like pets at home or anything? We'd like to admit you to the hospital. And she's like, admit me for like monitoring? And they're like scrubbing in. They're like, no, admit you for surgery right now. <laughs> So sure enough, she's like, hey, Gia, her ex, like, can you watch, you know, like, Houdini tonight? And yeah, she goes to surgery. She comes out. And in recovery, they're like, okay, looking good. Here's some, look at the scar tissue we removed from around your spine. Um, yeah, that falling down would have gotten worse, and you probably would never have walked again. And she's like, wow, when would that have happened? They're like, I mean, medical is not a perfect science, but this would have been in the next few days, maybe a week. Like, so the fat, and Kara is alive to this day, and Kara can still walk. I mean, she needs a cane sometimes, but like, because Emil, not for profit or anything, just decided I'm going to do this research and put it online for anyone to have. In my mind, like he saved her and who knows how many other lives. You've ever seen that meme, like me with a very specific problem. And then like on, on high, it's like random obscure YouTuber overseas with 12 subscribers that has like the answer because they did something and like the answer is out there. I love this kind of thinking. People ask if these are durable, can they break, can they fail? There are videos online of a lot of testing showing really rigorous things. I've never seen one fail. I'm aware of one Bash Ninja, his failed, and they eventually popped it out, right? They found a hairline crack on it. Now, whether this happened in his body or pre-insertion, we won't know. But again, the QA is really high on most of these. Out of thousands of implants, this is the only one I've ever known that failed. We're not going to get way into it because we do not have time. I promise you I'm wrapping up in a couple minutes. When we say, how secure are these? We've talked about RFID security. A lot of RFID is not secure. Low frequency is not really secure at all. But if you get like, I'm going to get a high frequency you know, credential. It's going to unlock my door. This was me unlocking a deadbolt, right? This is a high frequency tag in my hand in this instance, right? High frequency can do encryption. It's like taking that piece of paper and putting it in an evidence bag and then zipping it up and locking it in a safe. Because if we look at this is the MyFair credential like memory map, there's that card serial number, which anyone can read. Like you present it, that's what it shows up. But the rest of the memory is protected memory, right? There are protected data payloads. You can even see where the, where the actual PAX payload is on this MyFair credential. However, that main secure memory segment is the only thing that's protected. But it means it's hard to interact with unless you're using an official like MyFair system or iClass system. All of these third-party products that are like RFID lock, man, and RFID door and deadbolts, most of them aren't going to use this because they can't interact with every manufacturer's secure memory modules. Most of them interact with the card serial number. That's called running in CSN mode. It's like you have this safe with all your data, and it's like the guard is like authenticating you like by looking at the serial number on your safe. So you can, that's those magic credentials. This is how we screw around with a lot of high frequency systems. If they're running in CSN mode, you don't have to dump the secure memory. You can literally read a card serial number, shove it into a magic credential, and I've been with many instances where that will just start opening things because that, that is the risk. So if you want to learn more about this, ask me later in the bar. Again, like you can get magic credentials. You don't need them in your body. You can just buy magic credentials and play with them all the time. Somebody showed me their, their building. Like, hey, we have this parking garage thing. Could I make my, could I use like, could I use my implant to do this stuff? And I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, it's RF ideas. It's a well-known company. They support all kind of credential tech. I don't know which credential you're using, but look at all the tech they support in CSN mode. <laughs> Which credentials do they support actually with secure memory? Very few. <laughs> there, there are some open standards that like the LEAF standard was out there. We're, we're not going to dig into this. This is not a deep RFID talk. If you are interested in really doing secure access control, you're probably not doing it with an off-the-rack implant unless you know what you're doing and you've talked on the forums, you've talked to vendors. Can you remove them? Yeah, absolutely. You can pop them out. You can pull them out. Sorry, a little bit of blood. Now, 
will end by saying, <laughs> there are also questions and comments I get all the time from non-hackers. <laughs> and we'll show you some highlights as we wrap this up. So as uh, you've seen, like, we did this video. It was very fun. We injected a credential. People watched it. People loved it. Some people didn't. Behold internet comments. <laughs> so here's our top 10 of the kind of stuff we get and you will be subject to if you get into this kind of tech. They are officially demons. Did you hear about the Pope signed a bill with Islam? OK. Number nine, set the chips on fire. I would never shake that in my body. Number eight, the mark will reprogram your DNA. Once you get it, you can't get the mark out of you. Some of you may have family members who share stuff like this. The chip has demon seed that will alter your DNA. Demon seed? Homeboy got beastied, signed his own death warrant. He's going to hell for the oven. By the way, in the Bible, you're not supposed to get the chip. I'm sorry, you're going to. I love that modern rogue jumped in the comments. They're like, you're not my real minister. <laughs> Once the chips, you're, oh, you're a walking meatball. A flip of switch can kill you with power. No, that's not how any of this works. This is not 5G. Like, again, you under, I'm, I'm making fun, but also talking about misunderstanding. May the forces behind these evil agendas be eaten alive by a sworn of locust. OK. <laughs> How creepy are those guys? So funny, ha, 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 ha. No, it's going to change your DNA and damage you. These two guys in the ad are now destined for hell. The two of them look like Illuminati soy boys. They're the biggest geeks I've ever seen. Pure human trash. Not that I'm hating, but it had to be said. <laughs> People are getting dumber and dumber. And I said, you have no idea how right you are. Now, while if anyone was in Adam's talk right earlier, right, the idea of you can be righteous and indignant, or you can be kind and listen. And it's fun to sort of just like point out, oh boy, those crazy non-scientific literate people. There are people out there who are really scared of a lot of technology, not just this technology. A lot of the things we do as hackers make people panic. A lot of people think there are forces out there that are controlling them and that are targeting them, and they fall prey to charlatans and people who will pay them to like scan their body and get the chips out. There are people out there that will tell them, don't actually go to your doctor because your doctor is working with Bill Gates to track you. Hackers, our job is to fight snake oil and to fight disinformation. But the usual approach we have of like ridicule and humor, that's what we do up against big corporations and big entities where you want to burn it all down. Your friends and family members, the people in your community need a different approach. Mr. Rogers talked about the most vulnerable among us having deep feelings. And in crisis, you don't leave them isolated. Again, Emil put a whole post up trying to explain to people, you're not crazy, I don't think you're crazy, but let me walk you through this. Reach out to your family members and your people in your community who may need help, who may need guidance, people who are slipping through the cracks, who don't think that mental health care is okay. Learn about deprogramming people through empathy. You talk to them, you say, you try to validate them, you say, why do you think someone would do this to you? Let's talk about what the, t well, why would someone be coming after you? Learn to do that with empathy and kindness and demystify what we are talking about today. Otherwise, you're going to just be seen as someone perpetuating fear and a Fox News story. I know we ran a few minutes long. You've been wonderful. Thank you so much. I have loads of stuff to give away. There will be questions later. I will accept a hastily shouted question as I get off stage and I'm packing up, but they are trying to wrap up. I had a wonderful time here. Thank you so much to B-Sides. I love you all.